Yeah, that actually just did happen. Joan, give me a Snapple. This week on the Squatchers Lounge Podcast, Yowie! Do we have a topic for you? That's right, we're talking about the Australian Yowie. What is it? How did it get there? And insert dingo joke here. Good one, Elijah. So you're saying dingo jokes are offensive? Well, shoot. Now I got nothing. Koalas in the rain and the Reverend Jeff Kelly. Ah! <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Squatchers Lounge Podcast. And I am your, your host, the Reverend Jeff Kelly, and thank you for joining us. That is my little buddy, Eli, the Batdorf of the future. <laughs> and he just loves to help with the podcast intros, and I say thank you very much, Dr. David Batdorf, studio scientist. How you doing, buddy? Uh, yeah, pr- pretty good, pretty good. He, he, he's becoming more involved now, and he actually grabs the microphone and uh, and talks into it, and it's pretty funny, so I, I have to include him sometimes. I'm and sorry. You know, <laughs> yeah, and I've got a face for radio, so, you know, that kid's like perfect on his way to becoming an actor. We're going to get him in some kid acting Sasquatch shows or something. REI should like snap him up for next year's little kid uh, little kid camp and stuff. So, hey, guys, it's been a stellar week for Bigfoot stuff. And, uh, you know, we're going to start out backwards to forwards this week. A bunch of stuff hit the old Reverend Jeff's news feed here this week. So I wanted to kind of share some stuff with you. Um this week, I don't have a giant white box on my screen, so I can actually do this properly. Hey, that's right. Planet Weird has relaunched their entire website. Dude, it has gotten a whole new look and feel. <clears throat> if you don't know who Greg and Dana Newkirk are, well, you suck. Um, go out to weirdhq.com and check out their new Planet Weird page. They've been working with road trippers for the last couple of, well, I guess it's been 18 months now since they've been in the States, and they're doing great things there. Well, they've gone and moved stuff all around on their website, too. What used to be the Who Forded blog is now becoming the Weekend and Weird. And I gotta tell you, I like these kids. They did that the documentary uh, Sasquatch Hunting Still Looking, Bigfoot Hunter Still Squatching, damn it, it's here somewhere, um, about Tim Holmes. Yeah, here it is. Bigfoot Hunter, still searching. And uh, you can actually play the video off the out the feature film um, that a bunch of kids answered an ad in the newspaper and went off on an adventure. Have you seen this before? I, I have, actually. <laughs> It'll blow your mind. <laughs> It'll blow your mind. And this guy's still an active Bigfoot hunter. So go out to the website, check it out, dude. I love the New Kirks, man. They're some of my favorite people. And they're definitely one of my favorite couples next to the Catinos. I've had some good back and forth with, with, with uh, Greg for sure. And, and it's been, uh, yeah. Well, a couple, like he, a couple crush. If, if, if you have a couple crush, that's one of mine right there. Oh, yeah, for sure, dude. They're touched in oh so special ways. I've actually been trying to get them to come out to either the June camp out or the July Bluff Creek trip. I June. think that would be something that Planet Weird should do, but the June trip should be epic. Uh, coming up next, uh, you know, gardening and renting, not mutually exclusive. I have no idea what this is. So we're going to go ahead and skip on past that one. Um, <laughs> U.S. Forest Service admits that they believe in Bigfoot and they're protecting his habitat. Yep, That's right. Loss of space threatening the North American Sasquatch. It's right here on the USDA U.S. Forest Service website. I read this thing and I'm like, dude, on their are blog, you kidding just me? Just today. It yeah, it's like just today. Wide open. You oh. know, uh, right after the Sasquatch washed up in Oregon, you know, yeah, it's today, now, all of a sudden, the U.S. Forestry says, yep, we're going to protect the Bigfoot thing. And then I got all the way down here to the bottom, and it says, and see this website. So I clicked on it, and it says, webpage not available. This was an April Fool's Day joke. To, oh, you bastards. Dot for his time to us. Yo. You know, April Fool's <sighs> is one thing, guys, but ha-ha, joke's on us once again. What do you think, Dave? I think it's fantastic, actually. If fantastic. nothing else, 
<laughs> at least they could have gotten the picture not to be broken. You know, it's yeah. been broken like this for like hours. You know, come on, web dude, at least get with the program. <laughs> uh, I, my, my heart was just like, oh, dude, finally on, there's it's, some. It's, it's a government bug. I mean, you can't expect everything to work all the time. <laughs> there you go. But at least they can <laughs> throw some. Meme. Hey, who paid for this April Fool's Day joke? Some clown was on government pay when they did this. <laughs> nah, I'm just teasing. Way to go, guys. It was funny. It was an April Fool's Day sighting for sure. And then I come across this. Field and stream, dude. Sasquatch and the steelhead. I'm like, no, dude. There's no way they got Bigfoot catching steelhead on the field and stream site. Sure enough, yep, Waste Deep Media has brought Sasquatch to fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Got to love him and his trendy hip waders out there, but he's got impeccable form with that fly rod. Look at it just rip through there. And uh, before too long, Dancing Sasquatch has him some salmon and there's some trout on the line. You know, I, I, didn't, thought, I, didn't, I didn't know that about the actual uh, the form of, of fly fishing was was the, the, the yeah. <clears throat> you, you have to have the sweet <laughs> moves in order to actually cast properly, yeah. You know, that's what Grandpa always told me about fly fishing was he couldn't dance. That's why he could never fly fish. He says, when you're fly fishing, you're dancing out there. And damn it, he just never learned to fly fish. So use a bobber and a worm like everybody else, jackass. But uh, so, you know, that's my thoughts on the whole fly fishing thing. But, yeah, I thought that was cleverly done. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money to send somebody out there in a $100 Bigfoot costume to make a video like this. It takes days and days and production hours. It's, it's I just thought it was fun that, that they're picking fun at Bigfoot without making us all look stupid. Yeah, but also they had to catch a fish. So how many times did they send that Bigfoot out there? I mean, oh, dude, bad. I can't imagine how many of those Bigfoot suits they probably have with them. I mean, that thing's going to get waterlogged and stinky and cruddy to wear like really quick. Joke's but, on uh, them. That's right. Ha ha. <laughs> so Field and Stream's got a Bigfoot uh, dealio up there if you want to go check it out. Um, across my feed today came another new one from Timber Giant Bigfoot. Now, it was not po posted on April Fool's Day, so I don't believe that it is a joke. But as you see free-framed here on my screen, there is a footprint in the mud. Now, there's also a lot of ATV marks through the mud and a bunch of tire treads through the mud, so God only knows what it is, but he follows this trackway for quite some while and then picks and shows you what could be impressions, what couldn't be impressions, but finally he's kind of taking it as, well, I don't really know. I know when I came by here a couple of weeks ago, these sticks weren't like this, now they are. You know, so maybe he's taking a step back at himself and not taking himself so seriously this year. We'll see. But he is definitely like the phoenix, risen from the fire, risen from the axe. <laughs> but but I, uh, he did take the scientific approach, which is to poke at it with the stick. The stick, that's as right. Poke around at it with a stick. <laughs> yeah, that is the only way to know for sure whether or not something is um, there or not is to poke it with a stick. That's right. Is this a figment to... of my imagination, or is that a, uh, a shaped impression in the... Oh, nope, it's in the mud, and now my stick's in the way, and I can't cast that anyway. Okay, fine. <laughs> That's right. We got any Orlando, any Orlando, Florida listeners, they can remember old Bubba Whoop Bass Wilson singing Poke Around in It With A Stick. That's just something old farmers do, man. The like, first thing they got to do is just poke around in it. It's poop, especially poop. You got to find out what's in the poop. I mean, it's nice that you found poop, but I want to know what the poop's made out of so I can try and figure out what left the poop. So, so the first thing with, you do is get a stick and poke around in it. Yeah, with poop, that's that's the best thing to do because your other option is to poke around in it with your finger. Right, so and I'm not just have stick is appropriate, but this, this particular track didn't need to be poked at all. It needed to be looked at from a couple different angles and, and decided whether or not it fit the shape of a Sasquatch foot. Maybe not poked with a stick. <laughs> well, you know, Jim, we'll give you some luck moving on. Hey, dude, this is not an April Fool's Day joke. The uh, Bigfoot, dead Bigfoot, a true story, full movie, in HD, is now free to watch on YouTube. That's it. It's out there for everybody to definitively watch. And David and I, of course, have cameos in the movie. Um, hour and five minutes long, and it answers so many questions. And this is the story. This isn't what TV made the story to be. This isn't what documentaries made the story to be. 
this is what the story is. It's, it, it's the story that I heard because and and continued to hear subsequently from that point because I, I actually went up to the site and I'm standing, you know, behind Row while he's filming a lot of these things once we got to the kill site. I wasn't there for the polygraph, I wasn't there for any of the, the in home stuff, but the uh, the outside stuff, uh the walkthrough of what happened to him in the field, uh that other stuff was there, and so that was my first experience with that story. Was Justin selling that story for the camera? Uh, wow. Like it or not, go check it out. There's a lot of people uh, who. There's a lot of comments that you know. Some love it, some hate it, some call it a lion sack of crap. But you know, being part of the filming of of the movie. Yeah, we only have a little cameo in it, but we were directly involved with all of the, the, the background players who were actually creating the video. So we knew all the details to it, when they came out, how it was filmed, where it was filmed, when it was filmed, who said what. You know, and it, to see it all come together in the end, when I went to, to Sacramento for the for the, uh, for the the premiere of it, it, you know, there was a room full of people seeing it for the first time. It was it was it was awesome. I mean, it really does tell the story. Um, how he feels now may be different than what he felt when they filmed the end of that movie last year or a year before. I can't remember now when it was actually filmed. Um, but uh, it's it's definitely a great watch. Forget the TV stuff. Forget the documentary. Forget what Dr. Sykes's Garden Center guy says. Watch the movie. See what Justin said. Because that's really all that really matters. You can also see the polygraph and the polygraph results. That's important, too. I didn't really buy into that whole polygraph thing until I talked to some of my friends that work for no such agency, and they were like, yeah, you really can't beat a modern polygraph unless you're just a total psychopath. And I know he's not because I've spent oodles of time with the dude, you know, I crash on his couch when I go to Sacramento, you know, I'm going, you know, we go into the woods together, he's not a psychopath, he's not a liar, and I don't know, it just answers a lot of questions for me. And and it, for me, it brings everybody else up to speed with the, my exposure to the whole story, and it's, yeah. Uh, so you're 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 as good as I am with with uh, with the situation at that point. <laughs> That's right, and the links are all over the place. But you can go to uh, YouTube.com/slash/thebigfootreport.com, and you will find it directly there. And there's this is going to be one of those comment threads too that just go back and keep reading what the comments and the replies to comments are. It's going to be a whole lot of interesting stuff, sort of like the wolf shirt on Amazon. For any of you computer geeks out there that know what I'm talking about. Hey, next coming up, Grizzly. Dude, these Grizzly picks came out. Holy crap, man. Um, we were talking about this in the Coalition page the other day. Three simultaneous pictures of, you know, a bear looking for food in the wintertime. This is just DSLR trap. This is not HD game cam. This is not $600 Reconyx, you know, trail cam. This is a straight-up flashing DSLR. That's why he looks at the camera on the third snap. The first snap, it goes off, right? Clink, 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 and he's looking dead at it because there's no way to hide the noisiness of a DSLR <laughs> trap out there. But, boy, wouldn't that be interesting if that was a Bigfoot? That, uh, yeah, you, you get the full dimension like this does. The, the, the difference between... Like a like a a point and shoot like even or even like a GoPro and and the kind of camera that none of us can afford is that depth of field of the in focus and out of focus and and putting that in the aspect that your eye sees this is like what you see versus like usually it's a really flattened image where everything's in focus that omni focus. But, you know, the things that are closer than that grizzly bear are going to be out of focus. Things that are farther away are going to be out of focus. And it really gives you that, holy crap, that's right there. And it looks three-dimensional. And that's what... I didn't think it was real at first. I, I honestly yeah. didn't. I, I thought it was a total setup. But, no, that's... The, you can tell, by the way, the fur changes from it being pissed off on that third click. See, the hair goes from laying down all nice and, and nice and cuddly to what the hell is that in seconds between these pictures. It, it's the difference between a really like a really complicated like mechanical aperture that's that's working to take in the image and and to and process it appropriately, or a quick point and shoot. And I, like, like I said, like the trail cams and the GoPros, they're good at 
capturing an image of something, but they don't capture the depth of image. They don't mimic what the eye does. They don't mimic the depth of field and the and and the focal length of of what we perceive as humans. And so that whole the the, DS, the SLR cameras are meant to show us in a picture later what our brains create from our environment. Right. Yeah. And that that's that's how they, they kind of like how you you know headphones reverse engineer what the eardrum does to put it into my eardrums right now. The DS or an SLR it doesn't have to be digital. Like an SLR camera gives me an image that my brain perceives as I would see it in three dimensions versus you know. It, it, I feel like I can walk through this yeah. picture. Uh huh. Exactly. Well, you know what's farther away. You know what's close. You know what you're focused on. You know what you're not focused on. It it's really selective, and that's the difference between SLR and just a digital camera. You you can have a, you know, eighteen twenty four like I, all the megapixels you want, but if you're not using, you know, if there's no focal length involved, you're not going to get the experience of seeing it with your own eyes, but this SLR trap um, really gives you that feeling, and I, I hope that people can get that from the 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 w w once we hit bit rate on YouTube and see see the difference between the trail cam and this is absolutely right. mind blowing, mind blowing. Uh -huh. Well, the next thing I wanted to talk about here, the Durango Herald, okay, is Bigfoot is the big deal here. Um, this California-based paranormal experts do succeed in killing Bigfoot, the Apostle Silverton resident. Law enforcement promises to throw the book at him. Uh, yeah, apparently the undersheriff uh, of Texas is not going to be really happy about these paranormal people coming there to kill a Bigfoot inside of it. Now, it's again wrapped around this SasquatchChronicles.com website debacle that's been going on. And I, I wanted to bring this up because down here at the bottom, the uh, the actual uh, undersheriff himself makes mention to the fact that he doesn't know whether Bigfoot is an animal or Bigfoot is some kind of a wild man. But either way, that kind of tells me that the undersheriff was willing to admit that Bigfoot is out there. He said, if Bigfoot is a human, then of course it would be murder. If Bigfoot was an animal, then it might be more a division of wildlife question. And I don't know what Bigfoot is. However, in that statement right there, I don't know what Bigfoot is, tells us that he definitely believes in Bigfoot. What are your thoughts on that? No, I, I think a lot of people are using this as like pointing the finger at like this guy knows what's going on or he knows more. No, well, he's just he's using if thens. I, I do this all the time. Like, you know, if Bigfoot exists, then I, but he didn't say the if and the then because he's not a scientist and he's not required to say a sort of those sort of things when when you're hypothesizing and you're putting together your your he's null postulating. hypothesis yeah he's postulating postulating versus hypothesizing versus theorizing no like uh, so he basically he he's saying i don't know what bigfoot is if <laughs> you know and 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 i really like enjoy the 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 fact that he's thinking about this where some of the other uh, wildlife agency people they ask a specific question okay well in this scenario in this thing and then this and could we shoot a sasquatch and like they were four or five like three or four years ago they said yes you on private property can take a non listed species blah 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 blah, blah. but what that's in reference to maybe you could you could argue that in the court of law but what he's saying is that if you go on to public or even private land and, and shoot a Bigfoot, then they're going to, quote-unquote, throw the book at you, which is appropriate in, in most states and including Texas. And there's this one kind of weird loophole with um, fur-bearing, non-game animals on private property where it's kind of like, you know... Because there's a well, lot what of what a Sasquatch farm. jacket. It's fur bearing. Well, it's is it fur <laughs> or is it hair? But so, would be so, awfully easy to make. So it's it's interesting, but but in this gentleman's postulation, um, you know, he even understands the 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 fine line between um, human rights and non-human rights. You know, even if it's closer to us than a chimpanzee is close to us. Then it still has still not human. It's still not human. It's not a person. It's not a legal person. But there might be bearing because 
there's been a non-human kind of not not a personhood, but a legal personhood given to non-human rights of chimpanzees, um, you know, or or is is coming about in the United States. So in the United States, would not the Sasquatch also have at least the minimum amount of non-human rights as a chimpanzee? Yeah, but they haven't even defined what non-human rights are. But speaking yeah, of that, we're going to move into that because there's another there's another related story that comes along with that. Um, Adam Davies posted David Davis posted up the O-ring project, O-ring pendek project. Um, CliffBarackman.com slash research slash O-ring dash pendek dash project. You can find their cool shirts on Redbubble. Um, Cliff actually funds this project out of his pocket. Um, in the last couple of years, they've actually gotten some really excellent foot casts from some observed uh, encounters from some farmers down there, and it looks like they're really, really getting closer to uh, uh, picking up on exactly finding the Oren Pendek, much like possibly the Billy Ape was found in the Congo. You know, so go and check that out for sure. But China's growing social media army mobilizes against a new animal TV show. They take these orangutan, and basically it's a reality show of voiceover, and they make these animals act in just hysterically stupid things uh, for viewing pleasure. And, like, hundreds of millions of Chinese people said, no, this is just wrong, and you should stop this. Because... Hundreds of millions of Chinese people are educated, free-thinking people. They are activists, and they are uh, everything that... Right, maybe I'm stretching the numbers are. a little bit. They it's, are. It's, it's, they are. It's tens of thousands of critics on it, and there's 20 million viewers on it. But still, you know, I exaggerate it sometimes. But, you know, these are the same people who have the dancing bears. You know, there's another picture. They, they China has lots and lots of animal... Poor situations. I don't want to call them abuse because that bear doesn't really look like he's abused, although I don't know how many times he was smacked in the face until he finally sat there and ate the carrot like that. Um. Well, so, so here, like we, we've talked about in the last couple episodes, like the, the non human rights project and, and the animals who have that sort of consciousness. Basically, where they're talking about the participants here, uh, all of them are listed. There's chimpanzees. There's whales. There's elephants. There's orangutans. There, you know, pandas aren't included in that, but they're critically endangered. So we're, you know, like the the interesting thing um, about this, however, is the fact that these people are clamoring. Kind of, the, the, they're they're echoing what we're doing, what we're what we're shouting here in the United States. And there's a small pe core group of people over there, and a small group core group of people over here that are basically saying there is a difference between an, like an animal, a creature who knows when it's being forced to do something against its will, or maybe, like, maybe, maybe that's part of consciousness, is like will, like knowing like, hey, this is not what I want to be doing, versus something else, and, and a really interesting uh it goes right back to that non-human rights movement, and it's not just happening in America, and it's not just the 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 the, the Peter Wack jobs. Um, there, there's a lot of people around the world who are concerned about um, the exploitation of, especially, you know, conscious primates in in uh, in these sort of in, in this way. And there is no reason for them to to capture and use all of these animals for anything other... They're not using it for education. It's for a sitcom, right? It's a reality it's TV the same sitcom. people that put baby turtles in keychains and sell them to kids. And, and baby I'm, lizards. I'm sure, and... I'm sure those same 10,000 people who are objecting to this are echoed times five with the baby turtles in the keychains. Uh, and it, it will... Humans ever learn I, is the question. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, well, we both know probably not. But hey, we can at least hope that someday that'll happen. So there's the news for you there, people. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those strange weeks where nothing seems to work right, but then all of a sudden it's going okay. So while we're in the groove, let's finally hear for our tip of the week. And now it's time for Rules to Squatch By with your old pal, Wes. Number 36. 
stay cool. You got to stay cool. It gets hot out there when you're out there squatching or yowing, as they say, down and down. So just remember to dress accordingly. This guy's got it down. I wonder if we could get some of these made for the Sierra event. <laughs> what color would you get yours? I think I want mine in black. What about you, Dave? Rev? Come check out my recent work and my art for sale at westlosner.com. Stay squatchy, my friends. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be having a pair of those on, Wes, but hallelujah, amen. That was actually pretty funny. So, Dave, we're going to get talking here in just a minute about the Yowie. I do love me some Yowie. And we have... And now for tonight's topic. There you go. The Yowie Down Under. People have been asking, our, our Australian uh, listeners are strong. They say, hey, when are you going to do a Yowie episode? I said, well, let's do a Yowie episode next week. And here we are. So, David, um, walk us through, man. Uh, Yowie has been around since the days of the – it's an Aborigines word. It's not even a white man word. I mean, the, the Yowie, the story of the Yowie, the story of the Australian wild man – or Bigfoot-type creature has been there long before us stupid white people came there and made it a penal colony. They come, the stories come from the Aborigines on the island. So, you know, where would something of like that ended up for getting there, David? Is it possible that, that we miss something? I mean, are they swimming a thousand yards, or a thousand miles? Are they floating on balsa wood tiki? Talk to me here. Don't even get me started on the whole swimming and, and the Sasquatch and everything like that. But if we go to the Earth once more, which I, I like to do, I like to do, and we have the Earth here again, and we talk about these sort of glacial maximums that we have, and it, where all the ice is trapped at the poles, and you know we're not going to talk about global warming and how it's a myth, and that it's always been like this, and this continental shelf has just always been dry. Um, but anyway, so what you have here is a very distinct continental shelf, and a distinct movement of animals that has gone for for you know millions of years up through here, and then we have this distinct drop off here. Um, there's a yes, a low area lying down here. Um, we can talk about that later, um, and some of, some of these other barriers. Uh, and then we have Australia here, and that's this is this is Yowie Land. This is where Australia the Yowie looks is. funny. <laughs> What's wrong with Australia? It looks all rubble. dry. I just I'm having a hard time with the Yowie thing, man. I like Yowie after desert. Well, so so here's the thing. If if you if you look at context of size, and no, I can't just like jump to the United States and whatnot. But uh, if you look at the context of size, and you look at the actual, you know, the scrub and the areas of green, and there is a lot of you know this this could you know. This could potentially be the Olympic Peninsula. It's a little bit different color than I'm used to looking at on Google Earth. Maybe that's just a southern hemisphere thing. How the the light hits it, I don't know. But but there's a lot of a, a lot of habitat that looks really a lot like the Pacific Northwest down here. And I never even thought about the Australian Alps. Alps, mate. Yeah. yeah, that's Melbourne. You know, this is okay. This is the area that we are actually talking about. That see, this is my problem with it because the Yowie reports do come. They come from Victoria. They come from. The, see, now this makes a whole lot more sense than how they're going to end up in the desert. You know, yeah, nobody so ever here, points here, 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 out in the Yowie here. discussions that you know there's a great Greenland over there too. They even have a Blue Mountains, which is where uh, we all know that, like Paul Freeman found all of this stuff in Eastern Washington. You know, so the so the, yeah, the, they even have a Blue Mountains. Um, but this, this coastal region and and even um, you know there there there's 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 some areas uh, up on the Horn and and down here where there's probably a lot of good habitat. I'm not I'm not gonna say that like you know I'm I'm not gonna poo poo this like you know I I, I would I would poo poo even like a you know. Florida and some other areas where we know, Jeff, you know that there's some activity here, right? Mm -hmm. So let's let's pull this back into into reality a little bit here, and we talk about this dried out area. Humans probably got here less than possibly before, but didn't really 
take care of this place, <laughs> meaning, meaning, you know, like the mafia take care of this place, uh, until 20 to 30,000 years ago. And we're talking about really, really ancient peoples that were all anatomically modern humans that came through and basically, um, before we destroyed the environments elsewhere in the world, um, came through and burned this area out a lot. It was a lot of low-lying scrubland and brush, and there's a lot of data that leads us to believe that the hunting and corralling of animals was done through the use of fire in the grasslands, which, as we all know, continues to burn, and there you can cause a lot of problems. So what's left for Yowie proper, if Yowie is Bigfoot and Sasquatch, thing is these greener areas on the fringe you know no pun intended you know like the the outside of the 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 singed areas if you will um this continental shelf impa impassable well if you look at it in actual terms of distance that's that's a long a tiki, a tiki raft can get across that Absolutely, and if <laughs> if Sasquatch can swim from from Vancouver Island uh, over to the islands where I live, um, from one to the other, especially yeah, there have to be a reason. They're not not just could they? There have to be a reason that they would have to leave that most southern tip of whatever the hell they were at to get out into that water and go somewhere else. And they would have to be doing it in droves to be able to keep a breeding population going. I, I saw a, a YouTube video not too long ago of somebody who was actually in the area between um, b between Lummi Island and uh, and and basically like the the Bellingham area where I live, and there was a a mountain lion swimming freely in the ocean. Do, 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 do. Yeah, <laughs> swimming out there, no big deal. You Probably know. fishing. Hopefully, J Pod uh, orcas aren't out there. You know, look like a seal. No, no that so, would be the video to have. We the orca eating the mountain lion swimming the in mountain the ocean. lion <laughs> in in the in the Puget Sound, right? No. Yeah. So, what, what? Why do you do this? Because you're looking for love in all the wrong places. In all the wrong places. So, let's be a little bit more specific here, and let's talk about some of the theories of this whole thing. And one of the theories. Is from you know my man, East Asia right here, Homo erectus. Love this guy for the Sasquatch thing because not only because at one point this probably you could have walked straight through uh, from China you know this way and right on over to oh there you are America. Um, so you know but maybe this whole area was probably something that was uh, a little bit passable. I don't know. If you're interested... See, man, when man gets to the end of that peninsula, he builds a boat to see what's on the other side of it just because he's man. That's what makes him man, is the drive for knowledge to know what else is there besides what's here. I don't know that you know a Sasquatch-type creature is going to have those same thoughts. It's like they're going to be like Forrest Gump. They're going to get to the end of the ocean... And instead of getting on a boat, they're just going to turn around and go back. One of the greatest arguments for and against that statement is this Isle of Flores, where we find the Homo man. Florensiensis. The Hobbit man, <laughs> Homo Florensiensis, comes here. The reason that Homo Florensiensis probably got so small, he was probably a derivative of the early Homo erectus, uh, he got stuck here. Once, once the seas rose again, that last time, he got stuck here. And as things got smaller and smaller, um, you know, we, we talk about, there, there's like the, uh, the Sumatran elephant and, and uh, other things like that, where uh, things become diminutive when you run out of space. So that's a really great analog. Well, that's one what? thing that they do report, that the Yowie um, is smaller than the... Uh... It's smaller than the Bigfoot. As a matter of fact, uh, for a moment here, I'll put up a comparison of the two. That's one of the things that they do say about the Yowie is, you know, where the Sasquatch is seven foot tall, the, the Yowie is like, you know, six, six and a half feet tall at max. And, 
you know, 400 pounds and orange colored like an orangutan more so than the, the dark brown of the, of the Bigfoot. Um, but, you know, I could have come off of the island of Homo Florenziensis and become the Yowie that we, that we now have. Probably not. It would be more like it came from the same place that dropped the Homo Florenziensis there and during the same glacial maximum trapped Yowie on Australia. But that would also explain, and I'm sorry, my, my BFRO overlay is not here, why, why there might be more you know, explainable Yowie sightings over here and less over here. I, I don't know. So we're, we're, that, that's something that... Uh, we have Bigfoot sightings on Hawaii, and that's, you know, where, where this kind of a shelf makes sense, this over here is is problem, because this is <laughs> yeah, volcanic. Yeah, a little problematic there. This, uh, this raised area under the ocean here, Those volcanic that's, that's islands. A vol that's a volcano, where yeah. where this is this is a continental plate, and <laughs> right. there is, underneath the ocean, that plate is still there, and as the ocean rises and falls, this change of shape. So that, that 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 part makes sense to me. Um, but let's just talk about, uh, you know, maybe some of the other uh, ideas of what a Yowie could be. What if there are, um, you know, I, I could put up some uh, another quick screen share here of um, some ideas of why we didn't see a lot of other animals getting to Australia and why the marsupials are more more prevalent than, than anything. Yeah, why kangaroos there? I want can I wish we had kangaroos here, man. I like kangaroos. So so I mean here here's some of these these lines are like, okay, well these didn't these areas, depending on different glacial maximums, did not actually they, they weren't passable. You had to have a boat, you had to have something, you had to have I mean yeah, you, you couldn't just swim from one to the other. So there's some definite problems with this being a Homo erectus, right? So what if it was something else? Are we looking at a bipedal marsupial? Ooh, you know, that's like saying a calamarian. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's like saying, are we talking about squid people? I mean, we've never heard of a, a two-legged, hairy marsupial like that with long hair like a primate, but no one's actually caught one of these things. Now, I'm going to mention before my head explodes the J.J. Yowie people. Okay, I, I believed them for like the first six months until the dancing trash bag with the glowing eyeballs. That did it in for me. Thank you, gentlemen, but no more. And that's just, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that people, oh, that's a real Yowie. Do you remember the dancing trash bag with the, with the glowing eyeballs, David? Yeah, I do, I do, yeah. Yeah, see, that's the problem. Now we do remember when Finding Bigfoot went to to uh, investigate the Yowie, and and uh, I I've actually talked to Cliff about it privately, and uh, he was like, yeah, he says there was something out there clapping back at us. Now whether it was you know Aborigines having fun with us or the local farmers having fun with us, but something was out there interacting with us in the woods. Unfortunately, the camera crew did not get it on tape, so what we saw was all a recreation. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, but but at the same time, like, you know, it, you could say that about anything. It's like, oh, yeah, I, w was it the, uh, the the Native Americans that were making, you know, like, making fun of us for being out there? Was it this? Was it that? Was it... You have to have that higher... Yeah, higher standard. How are you going to show this? Um, TV is TV... Uh, but uh, I, I can't completely discount the Yowie because of so many. I mean, if you if you think about you know Sumatra and you think about these other areas, this is a a sea bearing, you know, peninsula if nothing else, like during glacial maximums, and it's you know it's important to be able to get from one area to another. If a mountain lion is willing to swim across three miles of water. To go find a mate in my area, and people are are willing to film this and and you know, steer their boat away because they think that the the mountain lion is going to jump on the boat. Um, this is this is a possibility in other areas, and if you're really only looking at 
three to five miles of of distance, that's I mean, it really, really starts to become an interesting question. You know, as uh, I'm, I'm just going to keep beating this this dead horse and different ways of looking at kind of the same thing. Um, and and you look at these these areas here, and they look very close, but there's a lot of distance here. So what 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 you have to do is. But and, is that there's just as much distance in the break from Alaska to Russia? Current day. Current day. And it depends. There's probably a, a bazillion little islands so in there that was there a land bridge sitting. leading to Australia when there was a land bridge leading to the Bering Straits? Uh no. And so because let me let, let me get into that because you, you need a much deeper like like a much deeper decline in the ocean level, which means you need a much higher period of glaciation. Glaciation. So here we have a quick graph of the CO2 composition of the Earth from about 800,000 years ago to about now. And right around this 400,000 year ago mark, remember, we only split from our Neanderthal cousins somewhere in this area over in East Asia, we're not even thinking about being there yet. Absolutely not. There are no human beings over here. There are, between 400 and 300,000 years ago, these really uh, interesting and really dis distinct peaks. This is our 10,000 year ago peak where we saw, okay, well, we can come over the Bering Land Bridge in this area. So there's only a couple other potential crossings for the Sumatran land bridge, quote-unquote. But the Sumatran land bridge needs to be even more intense than our Bering land bridge to, to be viable for transportation unless you can swim a long distance. And as we all know, primates don't breed that often, so we need this to be a pretty free-flowing migration from one area to another across water to be a viable thing. So it's uh, it's problematic. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's <laughs> problematic. It just, we, we need to be really, yeah, you'd have to be really specific and looking at undersea topo to figure out where was the crossing. And the beautiful thing about the ocean is that it loves to preserve fossils even more. Like the Librea tar pits have nothing on the Bering Strait for preserving fossils. They dredge that for this, that, and the other, and they come up with mammoth bones, and they just throw them over the side of the ship. It's like, God, another tusk. Blah. <laughs> that would be a phenomenal place, not only to look for our own human migration, but to look for other non-human migrations or prehistoric human migrations into into Australia for this. I, I'm sorry, I've gone off way too long on this whole thing. <laughs> it's okay. It's a good topic, though. Yeah. It, it really, it really is. But you know, the way I look at it too is, uh, who's to say when the when when the first reed boats were made? I mean, if Contiki can float from South America to Polynesia with enough people to populate the islands and start a new culture, um, God only knows what you know fleeing animals will do to get where they want to be. And how long have they actually been there? The one thing I wanted to point about the Yowie thing was is the Aborigines didn't even really specify what they were. They, they, they were wild men. So were they so wild of a tribe of people that the Aborigines didn't even want them around? They're like, y'all got to go like go live over there. <laughs> I'm just going like, to get out of here. Sort of like what we think possibly is going on in Russia, where it could very well be feral human tribes. Because there are some seriously wild places in Australia that people just don't go. I mean, they're just like, yeah, the brown snakes will kill you, the owies will kill you, the aborigines will kill you, everybody will kill you. So just don't go there. You know, that becomes the other question is, until somebody actually, again, gets a specimen or at least a subject type for some DNA, we won't really know. I am going to say, however, that there are some really wild places, you know, <laughs> on the continent down there that... that uh, are a lot bigger than we give it credit for. There's a lot of desert, yes. And, you know, being somebody who's looking for a large primate in the Pacific Northwest, I wouldn't decide to go to Joshua Tree to find 
<laughs> Sasquatch. Right. I would probably, you know, if I if I wanted to do a California tour, I might go to the Sierras and uh, and maybe camp out <laughs> with the Squatchers Lounge podcast. That's um, right. Coming up here in June, June 11th to the 14th, somewhere near Cold Lake, California. Uh, right now we're looking at a public site, which is 20 bucks per site per night, five bucks for an extra car per night, two tents per site. Info at sloungepodcast at gmail.com. The great Reverend Jeff and the amazing Dr. David Bator, pseudo scientist, are going to be hosting along with Sierra Evidence Initiative, Justin, Sh the Bigfoot killer. Shmiha. That's right. Come hear the story of Dead Bigfoot directly from the man himself. But we're not going to the site, people. This is real Bigfoot stuff going on. We're going to search the lower valley. We're going to get us some answers of what's going on in spring. What are you thinking about the trip, David? I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I would love... You know, we've got quite a few people coming already. I would love to have a, a, a core group, like a, a fairly large core group of serious people. Like the campsite... Uh, once it gets that large, is not going to be a, a night research thing. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to mobilize out from there. This is just obvious, but we can split into groups. It's gonna be awesome. I think that there's strength in numbers as long as you don't put all the numbers in the same spot because you're never gonna find anything. And as we all know, and uh, I, I I've been following a little bit more recently the uh, the Squatch metrics for the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, on Facebook. Um, Spring sightings, 78% of them are in the daytime. That's so right. That's... We, 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 can, we can go on our, our quick hikes. We can look at points of interest, areas of interest, and, and go look for, even if it's just finding an abundant food source and abundant animals, this helps the project. And, I mean, it, it invites you to be continually a part of the project. So th this is really important. Uh, to, right, to and the cost isn't to us. The cost goes directly to the campsite. We don't want none of your money. No. We just want your bodies and your help. That's what we want. You come prepared to camp in the woods for four days, and we'll put you to work doing real Sasquatch stuff. But we're not talking about all work and no play either. Uh, Justin and I were talking about lawn darts and uh, some, uh, some uh, 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 horseshoe tournaments. Um, and a couple of other fun things going on. Maybe some pellet target practice. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have a little competition going that way. So there'll be all kind of little fun things going on in and around the camp, uh, as well as some fishing. The fishing will be fantastic. So, you know, even if you're not into hiking around, there's going to be a bunch of fun stuff to do with the Bigfooters, as well as the serious stuff that we'll get into uh, once we get up on site. But, yeah, it's going to be a good time. We've got 15 people, 16 people signed up now, um, and, uh, and quite a few maybes. So we're going to reach our cap pretty soon. So if you want to get at us, send us an email at sloungepodcast at gmail.com. I assure you there will be there will be the party and there will be the real research, and uh, I, I, I'm going to be a part of both. It's going to be so much fun. I, I'm just looking forward to like the the vacation aspect of it, as well as just getting into the field and get. I, I haven't got my feet and hands dirty in a long time, and I will poke around in it with a stick. I will. That's right. <laughs> poke around in it with a stick as often as you can, especially when it's poop. Well, that's actually going to do it for us this week, guys. been a really fun April Fool's Day edition of the Squatcher's Lounge podcast. And when David actually said something earlier about uh, Koala in the Rain in the intro, well, there you go. Koala in the Rain. No Fs given because he's just a koala in the rain. <laughs> and if and if you understand the uh, the 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 Zay Frank aspect of things, that the koala never uh, evolved the uh, the 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 curvy brain. He's got the smooth brain, uh, which means they never had the thinky thinky parts. Uh, yeah, they don't have the. Yeah. No, Mama never taught them to the, come in uh, out of the rain. The evolutionary aspect of not having the thinky thinky parts of your brain is that you don't give a what. Yes, it's that's perfect. right. Well, for myself, the Reverend Jeff Kelly. Your host and your co-host, Dr. David Bator of Shudo Scientist. We want to thank you for listening, and may the Squatch be with you. Dude, camp is going to be just like fantastic. I got another super secret meeting with Smeha this weekend. 
Somebody's gonna die! Oh yeah! Something's gonna die! <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on! <laughs> I'm just gonna uh, <clears throat> keep swinging my hammock. Dude, laid back. With my mind on my money and my money on my turkey. Take that turkey. Don't give me a snapple. <laughs> 